Hey everyone, we're going to continue in this video talking about highway design and this topic is probably a topic that you have remembered before from previous courses that's why I'm putting a video for it for you just to refresh your memories about it which is horizontal alignment to remind you what's the meaning of horizontal alignment uh, now we, we have already had enough information about all the inputs we need for the highway we're going to start designing the highway, geometric design the highway. When we say geometric design, we want to design the dimensions and how the highway looks like. We have studied one equation that we're going to be using as the basis of this. If you remember this equation, R minimum, let me do it again, R minimum equals the design speed square divided by 15 the super elevation plus side friction we did this equation a lot and this will be the basis of our horizontal alignment so that, so what we want to do and what are the equations we're going to be talking about or refreshing your minds about we're going to be refreshing your, your minds about this this kind of equation when we have now our our alignment let me bring my this guy here, let me bring it better when I type with my pen here. So again, we're doing our horizontal alignment. It's a repetitive topic, that's why I want to just show you the video about it to refresh your minds. When we have our alignment, CDA and CDB, do you remember the alignment when we set a bunch of broken lines that try to go around your terrain and based on the information you have and the most famous information is some kind of contour or topographic information and this topographic information gives you an idea how does the elevation changes from one point to another by the way these these contour lines never meet, so they are lines that already go around each other. So it's something like this. Gives you an idea how steep or how no steep these roads are. So when you have these kinds of uh, contours, we start building a number of broken lines. We try as much as we can to go parallel to these contours, so we have minimum grades and minimum cut and fill we create these kind of alignment broken lines we now can do this also by using the computer uh, the second step which is called the horizontal alignment in other words we call it horizontal curves is to fit like we had in our lots of our projects and examples in class if you want to fit now a smooth transition from one direction to another a smooth transition from one direction to another a smooth transition from one direction to another the equation that I just wrote and was failed to write on, on, on a PowerPoint which is R minimum equals U squared divided by 15 super elevation plus saturation this equation gives us the minimum value of radius of these kind of curves given the following given what is the super elevation we're going to be building on that curve every curve has some kind of embankment or super elevation when it turns around and what is the design speed ud here and what is the side friction which depends also on the speed if you remember from our previous examples. So we want now to remind, remind you of how can we fit now the curves, what is, we now know the R minimum, so what are the different components? If you remember, there are very simple equations that define this, that come from simple geometry, geometry of the circle, because we fit here a circular curve. Okay, so let's get back here guys to our presentation. I'll try not to try to my presentation. Instead, I'll try to bring my whiteboard whenever I want to get to the presentation. So we're going to talk today about the horizontal alignment. 
some of these slides you might remember from previous class. So I'm going to go a little bit faster when we do that. So the high alignment is something in 3D. Definitely it's in 3D. Every work we do in civil engineering is some kind of 3D. That's why we try to break it down into three different drawings. Our drawings in highway design are three drawings. First drawing is called the plan, where you created the alignment. Again, I'm drawing on my PDF, on uh, my uh, PowerPoint, I'm sorry. So this is where you create your alignment, and also you want to fit the curve. So that's the plan. The second one, which we'll be doing in the next topic, which is the profile or the elevation. And the third one, which you can see here, shown you, if you cut here through the road, it shows you what we call here, the side view of the road. It shows you the lanes, the slopes, the medians, the shoulders from a side view, perpendicular to the center line. This is my center line of the road. So if you cut through the center line here, it will give you this kind of two-dimensional, two-dimensional two drawings. You have three of them. One, two, three. Plan, elevation, and side view. So in our horizontal alignment, since we're now looking from above, and this is our radius, we focus a little bit more on the plan. Later on, when you do the vertical alignment, we're going to focus on this kind of elevation view. So it's a three-dimensional problem, and that's the problem with most of our civil engineering work. And that's why you try to break it down in different views and different cross sections and different cuts throughout our drawing. So the design of construction will be difficult in 3D. So how you design again split into three two-dimensional problems. Horizontal alignment here, vertical alignment here, cross section here. And we're going to study all of these in detail, including the drawings. So let's start guys with the first one here, the plan which we call here the horizontal alignment or horizontal curves. So when you look at the plan, we have here what we call here the central line. You can see it here, the line in the middle. This is where we start with. And later on, once we finish the central line, we start adding now the, we call it the detailing of our road. Putting the lanes, putting the shoulders, and putting different parallel lines to create our road. But our main line here is the central line. When we want now to figure out where will the line go horizontally, meaning that it goes left and right, sees that this line goes this way and then that way. So we call this horizontal alignment and we can see it from a bird eye view, a plan view. When we look at the road from a front, this is where we create here the vertical alignment or we call it the profile. Profile is one of the most famous and important drawings in highway design. So profile has usually two lines, the actual earth, we get it from surveying, and then the designer comes here and he looks in the front, he starts now figuring out how will my road go up and down and up and down, and then he fits curve here with a vertical curve which we also be designing in detail. Very good picture here. This is the 3D. You can see here 3D. This road goes in two different directions, left and right, with this kind of curve. This is the curve we're going to design today. And another kind of curve going up and down. You can see this road is going up and then going down again. Here it's going down and then up. So we have this a lot of this, these kind of roads in, in, in mountainous states like the one we are here. So this is another picture that shows you road going down and then up. This is a vertical alignment. When we draw the profile, we imagine that we are cutting the road and looking from this side here. We're looking parallel to our center line. This is our center line. We're looking parallel to it. Another example here, when we show, this is like a bird eye view like you can see. It shows you here that I have a line, a line, these lines meet somewhere, and the designer creates a curve, another curve here, another curve here. So all roads has this kind of horizontal alignment. So we're going to discuss, and I'm going to do a little bit more than what we did in previous classes, like our transportation class. We're going to do a little bit more 
just not just designing the, the curve, we're going to do find lots of components of this design. So we're going to calculate the components of the horizontal alignment. And it's mainly the properties of the simple circular curve. Again, we have two lines. And we fit an arc. This arc is taken from a circle. So that's why we look at this, what we call here, the circular curve. So horizontal alignment, it's designed based on an appropriate relationship between speed and curvature and their interaction with side friction and super elevation. And this defines the equation or minimum, the minimum radius equal u design square divided by 15 e plus x. Along your circular path, there is always a problem that when you are going on a circle path, the inertia or the centrifugal force pushes you away on this side of the road. And that's why we create this kind of E, super elevation or embankment of the road, and it shows very well when we do the uh, NASCAR uh, tracks. Uh, this inertia causes vehicle to attempt to continue in a straight line, so it pushes it away instead of taking it into the curve. And here comes the, the super elevation. So super elevation both and side friction provides a force to offset this inertia. This force is directed towards the center of the curvature. So these two forces, either the friction and the super elevation tries to push it inside. And we have created, if you remember guys, we have done a proof of this equation here. So uh, the objective is that we want to figure, we want to create a curve that is safe and comfortable. Some curves you might drive on in some turn, in turnpike or different roads, it's not very comfortable. The curve is very tight, you have to slow down, sometimes you have to slow down really hard, that's not a comfortable. And you can all remember a curve that's really bad. We have this a lot in every state in the US. Also for safety, we want a curve, we don't want to have a curve like this, where there's going to always have a crash here and we have very famous curves where especially trucks have some crashes so our main objective we want to create the geometry of this transitional curve transition means you trans trans do a transition from this direction to that direction so this is the curve we want to be safe and comfortable so we have now we're going to learn two things this straight line we call it tangent Any straight line, we call it tangent. Why do we call it tangent? Because the straight line, if it changes direction, it tangents this curve. So we have either tangents or curves. We call it now tangents. So for this one here, we have a tangent, another tangent, and we fit a curve. Here comes a new thing that we didn't study before. It's introducing something called transitional. or spiral curve, I'm just going to transition or spiral curve. So let me tell you what's the meaning of spiral curve and how do we fit this in our horizontal alignment. So let's start with this guy here. We have here a tangent. You notice that tangent is on a straight line. It doesn't go left, doesn't go right. There is no radius at all. So if we just try to fit the radius, the radius here is going to be equal to infinity. So this, uh, I can write it down. So it's called spiral curves. The second type of highway, when you have a curve. So this curve here has a radius. And this is the radius constant number. It's constant because it's part of a circle, meaning that this radius equal that radius equal that radius. So the radius doesn't change throughout the curve. We have other types of curves that have these kind of changes. And we're going to introduce this as well. So now, when we fit these two together, we have two ways to fit it. We have two ways to fit it. The first way is just to go ahead. You have a tangent. Fit the circle. So you directly have from the, this point here the change of radius. And all these forces happen suddenly from radius of infinity 
to radius of this constant. We do that a lot, especially when the curve is kind of smooth already. We don't have a problem that when we introduce these centrifugal or inertia forces. But here comes a problem when these forces are really big and we want to introduce these forces and these changes in some kind of a gradient way or we want to do it one, we want to do it one by one. And here comes the force. When you start here from the tangent to the circular curve by means of something in between. We call it spiral curve. You can see it here. From here from here to here, you have a curve that's some, something like a spiral. It has a radius that is changeable. What do you mean by that? The radius changes from infinity, when you have a straight line, to whatever the constant value of your curve is. So let me get back here instead of my really bad writing on on this, let me create a new whiteboard screen. So we have now a tangent. Let me just draw the straight line, the center line, I'm sorry. Call it like this, center line. That's my tangent, straight line. And you have a curve. And there again, this curve has a constant radius throughout a piece of a circle. If I want to fit these two together, I can go ahead and go like this, and then fit my curve directly. This is R, and this is R equals infinity, because it's a straight line. So this is directly from tangent to curve. From R equals infinity directly to R equals constant. But sometimes, because, again, there are no forces pushing you from the side on this one, but once you get here, you're going to find a force that pushes you away. And you need the super elevation to be built to resist these forces and you have forces inside. We can do this directly, or we can create something like this. A straight line, and then some kind of a curve that transitions you, that gets you ready to go ahead and the curve. This is what we call here the spiral curve. Why do we call it spiral? I'm going to show you in a second. We call it spiral because we take it from this kind of curve. Notice here, the radius changes from infinity here to zero here. There is no radius in the middle here. We take this part here, and we take it, we cut it, we fit it here. So you can have some kind of a transition from the radius of infinity to the radius constant over there. We're going to design this spiral curve, and this is the new thing, one of the new things we have in horizontal design in your, in your uh, highly designed class. Now let's move back to our uh, PowerPoint. So we're going to design the following. We're going to define here tangents, curves, and transitions, or spiral curves. The beauty about transition, not only just it, it gradually Put these forces to you while you go into the curve. It's another really amazing distance where you can change your cross section from this shape here. This is cross, these are all cross sections. Cross section from the tangent to cross section up here on the curve. What do you mean by that? When you're in the tangent, this is your highway, this will be a cross section. It's like a book. It's like a crown. You even call it crown cross-section. What do you mean by crown? You're going to find here side slope from your center line going down to the sides. And this is mainly for drainage. And this is what we call here crown slope. When you go on a curve, you're going to notice that this, this is, you can see, a normal crown. It goes from here to there. And in class, we're going to learn how do they we create drawings for the contractor to go from here to there. So what's there? There is when you run the curve, 
you're gonna find that your curve, your your highway, turns into this super elevated E with a side slope E. And this side slope here is the embankment. It goes all into one side to this towards the center line, the center of your circular curve. This is called the embankment you find on curves. So we're gonna move from this side to that side. So we introduced now something we did before. We're gonna do it more in our ash tool manual, super elevation. And we're gonna define something called E maximum and E design. What's the difference? I'm gonna tell you in a second. So super elevation first. Super elevation, we know that curves require super elevation, banking of curve to reduce sliding to allow the use of smaller radii curves. The beauty about super elevation, you can see that in the NASCAR races, is that when you have a good super elevation, especially for speeding cars, you can have a small radius. Why? Because again, radius equal u squared 15 e plus r. So if e is big, I can have small r. If r is big, I can have small e. So they are in an inverse relationship. So when you have a smaller radius, meaning that you're gonna you're gonna buy less land, because when you have bigger radius, bigger radius means that you need to cut more land. A uh, good example for the super elevation: this shape where the motorcycle or the bikers do when they turn, they create their own super elevation. And when you drive, you when you're in a curve, you you're gonna notice yourself doing this kind of shape. And this is a super elevation. You notice here the embankment goes towards your uh, center of your curve. And you find here for faster roads, this is how we build it. You, the contractor builds that. So, now let's talk a little bit once we just introduce you guys of what's the meaning of supervision. Yeah, I want to get back here and, and ask the question. What is the difference between Emacs and Emacs? When you go ahead and you go and figure out your classification and speed, things that we did before. Based on H2, we can go ahead in the tables and define what will be the maximum super elevation for my road or for this area that I can go. I cannot go more than that. And then I'm going to go into the specific charts that will go ahead and define for every specific curve that we have. We know the E maximum. What will be the E design that we will calculate? We're going to do this in class. But that would be nice. Okay. Uh, so now, let's uh, let's now move to things that we did before. So I, to remind you guys, this is a circular curve. Two things we want to know, and two you can say constants or two things that you're gonna start with your curve. This angle here, which you call here deflection angle, and also R. Based on, let me get back to my. Uh, my whiteboard here because it's I want you to understand that. So here we have two lines and we start with these two lines, two tangents. This angle here, if I extend the first line, this angle here we call it delta. Some other books call it I, delta or I doesn't matter. We call this deflection angle. And here comes the geometry, the simple geometry of the circle. And this is why I'm creating this video. If you fit any curve, big curve or a small curve, this is a big curve or a small curve, you're going to notice something. Since they're called tangents, this curve will tangent these two lines in two points. If I draw two perpendicular on these tangents, they're going to meet in the center of the circle. And this angle will also be equal to that. That's for a small curve. If it's a bigger curve, that's R1. First radius, R1. But having a bigger curve, R2, same thing. If I go from the tangent and create a or draw a uh, perpendicular line, it's going to meet in the point here, which is the center of this circle here. And again, this would be the same angle delta. So from the geometry of the circle, this delta 
equals that delta equals that delta or this i equals that i that I. we call it the central angle or the deflection angle if you know this piece of information guys then everything will be easy let's also introduce something else since we're now just putting the circle not putting any spirals yet then we're going to name some points here these are the famous points we're going to name this is called PVI point of vertical intersection um, soror, I'm sorry here PI only PI, 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 PI let me even delete that I don't want to show it in my video so let's do it again so my PI here point of intersection where the two tangents meet and it's an imaginary point meaning that not an imaginary point it's not a point on your road it's a point but very important uh, point for setting up the road especially for surveyors and this is the PC point of curvature and finally PT some other books call this beginning of curve BC and this is end of curve BC this or that it should be the same now let's go ahead and see the different equations which i want to reach here so this is again the angle delta and whatever r is you can see here the straight lines and you put here the circular curve and whatever the circle curve is going to tangent the two lines and two points here you put perpendiculars it's going to meet at the center of the point and you have your delta when you put here a spiral then it's going to be a little bit different. So let me put here now the spiral. So when you put here the spiral, let me just bring my... It's almost the same, but now this is my two lines here. We have our spiral at the beginning. And at the end of the curve and then you put your circular curve so we have now four points we call this we call this t s tangent spiral we always have one direction of the center line we always build our curve in one kind of direction you're going to find we always do it from left to right but some people can do it from right to left, but we always do that like something you're used to. This point here is spiral curve. This point here is curve spiral. This point here is called spiral tangent. And the point in the middle here again is pi doesn't change. And the delta here is the same delta. And we're going to define now the new central angle once we have a spiral. So things will change a little bit. But let's again go ahead and work with our main equations for the circle and this is where I'm going to end my video today. So we have different kinds of curves. We have what we call here a simple curve, one curve. We have something called compound curves. When we have two different curves with two different radii and they meet in the same point, so there are multiple curves connected directly together. We usually start from the bigger curve to just introduce the curvature to the driver and then the shorter or the worst curve here or the smaller radius curve. If we have here a tangent between them, we call it broken back curve. Finally, we're going to do, or we have one with curve changes directions, we call it reverse curve. In our class, we're going to design each of these curves one by one. But let's go ahead and put the equations for the main curve. The first equation here is when you calculate the minimum radius. We all know that. This is from H2. We did this and we even proved, we were able to prove that. And if we have here two equations for metric and for custom, the only difference is this number here. Instead of 15, we have 127. So now let's talk about the maximum super elevation. It's controlled by four factors. Number one, what, how, many, how much ice and snow you have. Number two, the terrain. Number three, what is the percentage of trucks, of slow moving vehicles that might influence the high super elevation rates. And 
Usually, this is the highest number we use, 10 to 12 percent super elevation. Again, we want to figure out what is the super elevation, the embankment, the maximum super elevation for our specific highway. So these are the four factors that that we go ahead and and, and decide that. Usually, we put 8 percent logical maximum to maximize slipping by stop vehicles, to minimize slipping by stop. So again, the problem with bigger super elevation, if you're parked here, and it's snowed, you're gonna slip. So that's why we don't make it so big, and that's why we first thing we want to figure out what is our maximum super elevation. I'm gonna show you on Monday or I'm gonna show you in the next class what are the diff how can we get this using H2 and how can we get the minimum radius and then using these charts, how can we find the design super elevation from the maximum super elevation? So I'm gonna just skip it in the video and we're gonna do it directly in our uh in our class and we're going to also do these drawings here of how to draw the super elevation and what are the different kinds of drawing the super elevation so let me just move ahead towards our things that we did before in when we talk here about the geometry of circular curves so we defined by one of the two things here number one when we have a curve we're going to put a curve we define this curve, or how curved it is, or how curvature it has, by either one, two things. Number one, radius. And radius is a number in feet or in meters. Tell me how small or big your curve, how tight or smooth your curve is. The bigger R, the smoother the curve is. The second thing, which is, very, which is related to R, something called the degree of curvature. Degree of curvature, we have two types. We're going to do this one here, the arc definition, because we use this in highway design. The second one, we use it in railway design. It's very simple. If you measure on your highway, 100 feet, one station of distance, 100 feet, piece of pizza, then you here take the slice where you have R and R, and the relation now cut R, comes here, the angle here, the angle of this slice of pizza, the angle from here to here, of that encloses this 100 feet, we call this degree of curvature. So it's in, in degrees, it's the angle, the central angle that encloses 100 feet. For the chord definition, we use it in railway, it's not a curve, it's not an arc, we use it for a chord. So this is the arc definition, central angle subtended by 100 feet of arc along the curve. It tells you how short of that, because if you have a big angle here that includes 100 feet, then you have a very, very tight curve, you have a very, very small radius. If you have a smooth curve, then this angle becomes very, very, very small. So that's the difference between how sharp or how flat your curve is, and we define this by D. There is a relationship between R and D because, again, it comes here because you know that this distance here equals the angle in radians times R. And here comes the equation here. So, again, it's 100 feet. That encloses an angle of D. This is the chord one. So, instead of measuring 100 feet of curve, you can measure 100 feet of chord. gives you also the angle D. So, that's the relationship I was telling you about. It comes from, you, you know now that this 100 feet is equal to R times D, R times D. But R, sorry, D has to be in radians. So this is how we change from radians. So it's 100 feet, that encloses 2 pi R. And here comes the equation 5, I put it like this way, R equals 5, 7, 3, 0 over D. Again, it is... The, this relationship tells you that d over 360 equals 100 over 2 pi r. So this is just a ratio telling you for the whole circle. If this is 360, we can do it again. Let me do it again. Let me do it again. Here. So it's like this. I have 100 feet, and I want to know the value of d. Well, I can do it this way. Instead of a whole circle, let's do half a circle. So half a circle, this angle is 180, right? So I know here that 180 
is equivalent to this distance here, usually this distance here, which is what? Pi r, right? So it's pi r, because this is pi, equals to d, which gives you 100 feet. And this is how we calculate this 5 to 80. So d equals the relationship of radius, sorry, 5 to 30, divided by r, or, or, or the other way around. Okay, guys, so now let's go ahead and uh, get back to our presentation here. So this is the first equation. To define your radius, how flat or smooth your curve is by this equation here, 5730, not 5230, 5730 divided by d, and again it comes to this very simple ratio. And one thing you need to know here, uh, this is the equation specific for feet. If you want to do it in metric units, we can do it also in metric units. It's just a different equation here. But all the other equations, R, you can do it in metric units because it's going to just be some trig functions with unitless values. When we do railway design, we take 100 feet of cord. So the equation comes like this. R equals 50 divided by sine d over 2. And this is the relationship between R and d if you're going to do the cord definition. So it's very for gentle, gentle, gentle curves for railways. mean big, big, big radius of curves we use it specifically and then now here we're going to put our relationship here we have a curve we have r we have the angle delta which is this delta here we need to define some values number one something called t which is the tangent distance from here from the pc to pi and also the same distance from pi to pt based on the geometry of the circle so that's called t, t. We want to also calculate what is my chord length. We call it LC. We want to calculate the length of the curve L. We, want to, we have R. So we want to calculate the location of this guy, this guy by these values. Also, we're going to calculate two other values. This value here from the middle of the chord to the middle of the curve. If we pass a line from here, PI, to the center of the curve, it cuts everything in the middle, it bisects everything. So the distance from here to here is M, the distance from here to here is E. We call this external distance, we call this middle ordinate. And here comes the, the definitions first, the point of intersection, deflection or intersecting angle, the radius, PC, PT, length of curve, Tangent distance, which is this distance from here to here. The chord distance, which is the distance, straight distance from PC to PT. And I don't know what happened here. I don't just close line. So again, the length of chord here is the straight distance from PC to PT. The external distance is very famous for us when you want to calculate, especially for surveyors, when you want to calculate the distance from the PI to the middle of the curve, and then the middle ordinate, and, and here comes the equations. So now these are the definitions of these values. Now here are the equations, they're very simple. Trig equations comes to the geometry of the circle. The tangent distance, this guy here, equals r, tan, delta over 2. Everything is related to delta over 2, like you can see here. The core distance, or lc, oops, it is lc, equals 2r sine delta over 2. We're going to prove all these equations, guys. And then, the middle ordinate, let's put it this way, r, 1 minus cosine delta over 2. Finally, the external distance is equal r, sec, which is 1 over cosine, delta over 2, minus 1, or whatever equation you like.
And we did this already. The relationship between D and I gives you this here. 5, 7, 30. Uh, relationship between the degree of curvature and R. Sometimes you start the question, I give you the value of D, you want the R, or vice versa. So that's kind of a... Uh, all the equations. One equation we forgot to it, we can get it in different ways. What is the length of the curve? We can get the length of the curve different ways. We can get it from D directly. Or we can say the length of the curve equals radius times delta. Delta in radians, so you put it in radians pi over 100. So, and this, so we know we can do it like this here. If we have the degree of curvature, le length of curve equals 100 delta over d. So it's a ratio between two different angles. These are all the equations that we inherited from previous classes. We're going to go directly next uh, class to go ahead and solve some questions about this. I'm going to start with this question here, but I'm going to finish my, my, my video now just showing you how we're going to put the equations, prove some of these equations together, and then we're going to go ahead and solve the questions. Thank you guys, and I hope you enjoyed this video, and see you soon in next class, and have everybody an amazing day, and thank you so much.